conflict is an anglophone construct to tell a story. Well, so says Irish author Ronan Hessian, his, whose first novel, Leonard and Hungry Paul, was quite devoid of major drama of many of the classics, instead focusing on the quiet lives of two ordinary men and their friendship. His second book, Panenka, which has to be reprinted even before launch day due to a number of pre-orders, it also depicts quiet people trying to find their way in the world. Though a very different novel this time around, less laugh out loud moments, but clear empathy still for the human condition. Well, to bring us his perspective on how different cultures tell stories and to tell us about his own works, we're joined now by Ronan Hessian. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Ronan. Maybe I can start by asking you about your latest novel, Panenka. It is officially being released on May 20th. A bit of a classic question here, but maybe you can tell us a bit from where these characters come from. A 50-year-old man haunted by a penalty kick back in his youth, which in fact explains the title of the book, something I didn't know before getting my hands on it. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Yeah, Palenka is a 50-year-old man who carries a lot of, sort of pain from his past. Uh, including from his past life as a football career and his failures as a husband and as a father. Uh, and the idea, he also suffers from a, a very crippling condition where he gets these headaches that feel like a clamp on his face that he calls his iron mask. And it came really from two different things, from interviews I'd read about footballers, in particular a footballer called Daniel Tomofte, a Romanian footballer, who missed the penalty against Ireland many years later was still haunted by it. And also by documentaries I had seen about the British neurosurgeon Henry Marsh uh, and his dealing with people in the Ukraine who suffered from very difficult brain, brain conditions. So I put those two together really to try and create uh, a situation about a character whose life is largely unfixable. Mm -hmm. And because he can't solve his problems, the central question at the heart of the novel is, how do you find a path in life when you can't solve the problems in your life? Indeed, I can't stress enough that both of your novels are very different in, in form and in plot and in, in, in construct even. Uh, but, but they're both heavy in empathy and it looks like there seems to be this a value of the ordinary, a value put on things that don't change as much as things that do. Is that something you see as central to your work? I absolutely. Yeah, I think... When it comes to my writing, what I'm interested in is what is universal. My, my primary interest is in human nature. Uh, and I think in order to write deeply about characters and to write about them from multiple perspectives, you need to approach them uh, with, with empathy. And by that, I don't mean that you forgive them everything they do or that they're perfect people. Uh, it's really that you just avoid the temptation to simply judge a character or present them in a, in a one-dimensional way. So we get to see their death, we get to see how they change, and we get to see their ripening awareness about them, their own selves. And that brings a sort of learning experience. And so that requires a certain type of writing that doesn't necessarily revolve around conflict or, or resolution. Indeed, the complexity of the characters is definitely clear. Uh, before I ask you more about the form, just a personal question. The, the football team in Panenka is called uh, Seneca. Is there any reference to the Stoic there because they're such contemplative characters? I, I think I, I wouldn't make a too strong a link, but definitely it appealed to me, that aspect of it, the sense of coming to terms with life. But also throughout football terminology, both in the names of clubs and also some of fo footballers' own names. You know, we've had Brazilian footballers called Socrates, you know, for example. You know, so there's always been this backdrop of philosophy that's applied in football. You know, Albert Camus played football, you know, the Pope John Paul II played football when he was younger. So there's always been this idea of deep thinking as a backdrop to football. I have to say I'm getting a whole new view on football in, in general, having read that book. Uh, let's talk a bit, though, about the form. And that there's two things that struck me. One, it's the way conversations come about in Panenka. We don't always join them at the start and we leave them before they're finished, which seems quite true to life and brings us maybe into uh, the lives very directly. But I wanted to know more about that tactic. And also, these are people that are struggling to find their way through life but they live in, in towns that are very familiar and yet completely fictional. We don't know where they are. Yeah, that's right. The, the conversation point uh, 
is a perceptive comment. That was a deliberate change I made in this book compared to the first book. I wanted to try and immerse the reader in the conversations. So there are no real hellos and goodbyes. We get straight into the conversation. And I wanted really to distill the sort of essence of the dialogue between the characters and to try and really put the reader in the room. And in terms of location, yeah, I had to sort of create a town that was sort of uh, uh, an everywhere. I, I feel football is an international game and that these are universal human traits. So I wanted the, the town to feel recognisable without linking it to a particular country or city, but that it felt like a town in its own right, but had enough features that it could be not far from here and now, wherever that is for the reader. And it's funny, actually, because it was only when I'd put the book down that I realised I had chosen a country uh, to place the fictional town in. Uh, but tell me, uh, Ronan, you're an avid, avid reader. However, I believe that mostly you do not read Anglophone books. Why is that? Well, it's 95% of the world's population is from countries where English is not the first language. So I simply try and have balanced reading from that perspective. Uh, in Ireland and the UK, only about 5% of books that are sold are fiction in translation. So there's a real mismatch between the voices of the world and the reading tastes of English speaking readers. So I simply try and correct for that. Uh, and that has really informed my writing style uh, and it's informed my worldview purely by osmosis and absorbing those different perspectives and different storytelling. Indeed, I'm very curious about the different storytelling, you know, this idea that it's the Anglophone world that has created this story arc, if you like, where we have a question, a conflict and a resolution. Apparently, that's not universal. Can you give us a flavour of how other people do it? Sure, yeah, and I think, I think that basic construct has become popular in Anglophone culture because it's reinforced so much by, by movies. Uh, and I think there's been a huge influence on novels and the understanding of storytelling. When I read novels from Croatia, for example, a writer called Dasha Dernbich, her writing is very digressive. It goes from the present into history, it's reflective, it's rambling. Uh, and in that way, she sort of opens her, her mind to you and you have to accept it. And in, in French writing too, when I think of Naomi Lefebvre, uh, Matthias Ennard, very deep thinking writers who are able to have a lot to say about the human condition uh, and about society, but they don't restrict themselves into contrived set pieces around drama. And that liberates them, I think, and it enriches what the novel can be. I don't have a problem with conflict-based novels. It's just, it's not the only technique available. It liberates your own and on one hand, but also it opens so many doors. I mean, how does one sit down and structure such a novel? Well, I think that the main thing you need to do is to slow the reader down. You need to make sure that if what's going here on here is not a conflict or you know, a car chase or a shootout, that there's something else to draw the reader in. So you have to synchronize the rhythm, the rhythm of the reading with the rhythm of the lives of the characters. So at times that means you have rest chapters where you're just spending time with the characters like we do in real life. No, it'd be very difficult to have a relationship with someone where it was all drama. It would be exhausting and quite unhappy. So I tried to create a world in the books that's closer to, to real relationships. Uh, now, of course, Ronan, you work as a civil servant, but you're also a singer-songwriter. Do you think that your musical background has had an influence on your writing style? Absolutely, yeah. I think, first of all, because I've been creatively active for so long, I have a very comfortable relationship with my creativity, so I don't panic and I'm able to be patient for, for it to work whenever it's natural. But also when it comes to writing a novel, when I've written the story, I will always look for poetic openings. I will look for uh, openings in a paragraph or a sentence level where I feel something a bit deeper, a bit more memorable is, is called for. And that's a songwriter's technique. In particular, you know, finishing a paragraph with a nice image. So sometimes you write the ending of the paragraph first and then work towards it or work to disguise it. Uh, and that's, they're all songwriting tricks. 
interesting in some of your opening sentences, notably in Leonard and Hungry Paul, certainly gets our attention. His father died at childbirth. It definitely had me hooked very, very quickly. Um, both of your books, Ronan, deal a lot with male relationships and, you know, conversations and how men relate to other men and how they, they share their inner thoughts. Is that something you haven't necessarily found in other books? Yeah, I find that um, there are a lot of prominent books uh, that uh, are by men authors, obviously. But uh, I think some, there's some characteristics in male friendship that I, I definitely want to explore. Uh, I think it's interesting when men uh, converse as a group, they don't really bring their private lives to the table. You know, you can know somebody for a long time and meet them regularly in a social setting, in a group setting, and not really know much about their private life. You know, they will talk about their opinions, their ideas, all the unresolved stuff that's been in their head all week. So it's an interesting dynamic, I think, in our friendship. That, you know, when I come home from meeting my friends, my wife says, so how, how is Michael's wife and how, how are his children getting on? And I sort of shrug and go, I, I don't know, we didn't talk about that. And she, she kind of finds that strange. So I think it's an interesting aspect, uh, how other people bring out aspects of our own personality. So that's something I want to think Fantastic. Ronan Hestens, thanks so much for getting up that bit early over there in Ireland to talk to us here on France 24. Very much appreciated. Ronan Hestens there. And for any of our viewers, if you would like to attend the book launch of Penenga, it will be online and you can chew in through the publisher's Blue Moose Books. It's at 18.30 GMT. That's 19.30 UK or Irish time.